Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, let us discuss about the management of hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is defined as serum potassium more than 5.5 millilitres per litre. Normal lab value may be 3.5 to 4.5. Mild variation can be there depending on the labs. However, if the potassium level more than 5.5 millilitres per litre, it is hyperkalemia. There are a lot of different causes for hyperkalemia, but uh, uh, the major cause for hyperkalemia in emergency room will be renal failure. That is because the kidney is the main organ which controls the potassium secretion or removal from the body. So you can see here in the first picture, potassium balance is maintained by extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid uh, that uh, the exchange between intracellular and extracellular space it, it is maintained there are some drugs like insulin beta adrenergic stimulations alkalosis that's a clinical condition that can shift the potassium from the extracellular space to intracellular space uh, and other drugs like alpha adrenergic uh, stimulation exercises uh, plasma hyperosmolality, acidosis, all these things can shift back the potassium from the ICF to uh, extracellular fluid. So cell potassium can be increased by insulin, beta adrenergic stimulation, including drugs which used for beta adrenergic stimulation, alkalosis. So whenever there is, there is hyperkalemia in the extracellular fluid that is in the serum to reduce the potassium we use insulin beta stimulants like that acidosis whereas acidosis shifts the potassium from the intracellular space to extracellular space hyperosmolarity alpha adrenergic stimulation excess all these things can shift back the potassium from the intracellular to extracellular space and kidney try to regulate the potassium in the body that removes the potassium uh, through the urine. Dietary potassium will be around 1 milli equivalents per kg per day. So that will be a normal diet potassium in our body. If we see the causes for hyperkalemia, one of the most important cause for hyperkalemia is renal failure. It can be acute renal failure, it can be chronic renal failure. Acute renal failure means uh, patient develops uh, renal problem or acute renal shutdown due to causes like to the common causes will be drug induced renal failure uh, or uh, some infection like uh, leptospira induced renal failure. Uh, these are the common causes. Again, in, uh, there are a lot of other causes also. We are not going to the causes now. Chronic renal failure in our country, the most common cause for renal failure will be diabetic nephropathy. Whatever it is, uh, most common cause for hyperkalemia is renal failure. A patient with renal failure or CRF or IRF coming with bradycardia, ECG changes, always think about hyperkalemia, that is very important. Then potassium sparing agents like spironolactone can produce hyperkalemia. But if the kidneys are normal, Normally, this type of hyperkalemia will not produce clinical problem. Hypoaldosteronism can produce hyperkalemia. AC inhibitors, especially when it is given along with the spironolactone, it can produce hyperkalemia. And when the, uh, there is already a renal failure, AC inhibitors can aggravate the problem. Bactrim DS or sulfa drugs can also increase the potassium. And sometimes this can be spurious uh, hyperkalemia that is uh, because of the uh, like tight tourniquet uh, or stored blood cells can produce increased uh, potassium levels. That is a falsely elevated hyperkalemia, falsely elevated potassium, especially when there is a tight tourniquet and if you are taking blood from that, most of the time potassium can be high. Now other causes like increased intake. IV fluids containing potassium, high potassium containing foods or drugs. This is mainly occurring in a patient who is having renal failure and if they take fresh fruit, fruit juices, it can occur. Packed red cell transfusion can produce some amount of hyperkalemia. Hemolysis and release of potassium when it is infused can produce hyperkalemia. 
but these all things will not produce any clinical finding because kidneys are normal if the kidneys are abnormal all these things can become a problematic thing tissue breakdown bleeding into body cavities hemolysis rhabdomyolysis especially in trauma patients if there is a severe muscle injury rhabdomyolysis you can see potassium will be uh, elevated shift hyperkalemia or shift hypokalemia both both are possible shift of potassium out of cells will produce uh, uh, hyperkalemia that is classical condition is metabolic acidosis including lactic acidosis diabetic ketoacidosis all these things uh, potassium may shift out of the cells and it can increase the serum potassium hyperkalemic periodic paralysis this is classically associated with thyroid disorder there are two important types of uh, periodic paralysis hypokalemic and hyperkalemic here it is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis patient develops some muscle weakness because of the hyperkalemia and muscle weakness is also known in hypokalemia but that is the most common finding but these conditions are called as thanalopathies beta blockers sometimes can produce increased beta adrenergic activity drives potassium into the cells that produces hypokalemia digitalis toxicity due to dose dependent inhibition of sodium potassium atps thrombosis of produce potassium uh, alteration in and shift uh, potassium out of the cells now we can see the clinical features of uh, hyperkalemia most patients are asymptomatic symptoms starts at potassium level around 6.5 to 7 muscular weakness hyperreflexia progressive ascending paralysis this is the most classical finding of hypokalemia this will present with acute muscle weakness and uh, uh, it may be uh, yeah, like progressing and hyperreflexia also can be there respiratory muscle weakness can be there respiratory arrest can be there bradycardia is the classical finding in patients with uh, uh, hyperkalemia so whenever a renal failure patient coming with bradycardia always think about, think about hyperkalemia cardiac arrhythmias are very very common and cardiac arrest also can occur so remember both hypokalemia and hyperkalemia can produce muscle paralysis in hypokalemia it is more prominent feature but here the cardiac arrhythmias are more prominent feature but patient can also have uh, periodic paralysis now what are the ecg changes we'll see 6 to 7 milli equivalents tall peaked t waves in almost all leads and short qt interval 7 to 8 milli equivalents loss of p waves widening of qrs complex 8 to 10 milli equivalents per liter sine wave that means qrs complex will be widened and merged with the t wave more than 9 ventricular tachycardia atrial fibrillation cardiac arrest so these are the ecg findings you are going to, going to get in hyperkalemia now you can see here very tall tender t waves which will be present in almost all leads that is classical finding if it is only v1 v2 v3 v4 it can be acute hyperacute anterior wall mi but if it is present in almost all leads think about hyperkalemia so you can see here tall peak t waves loss of t wave prolonged qrs complex sc segment elevation and ectopic beats ultimately it will produce a sine wave pattern and then it will lead to ventricular fibrillation assist all all these things now you can see here this looks like a sine wave pattern void bizarre qrs complex with tall t waves p wave is merged with qrs complex it's called as sine wave now hyperkalemia can be spurious hyperkalemia that we have already discussed tight tourniquet abnormal red cell membrane defects hemolysis leukocytosis thrombocytosis all these things will produce falsely elevated hyperkalemia so whenever potassium is high and if the creatinine is normal think that it most of the time it will be spurious hypokalemia hyperkalemia then redistributive hyperkalemia or shift hyperkalemia acidosis hyperglycemia beta blockers fractional uh, spalling digitalis overdose fluoride iron periodic paralysis so in patient who is having crush injury or rhabdomyolysis avoid fractional spalling because both will increase the potassium and it can produce sometimes problem so beta blockers can produce uh, hyperkalemia uh, beta stimulants can produce hyperkalemia mm-hmm. so we use salbutamol nebulization in hyperkalemia real hyperkalemia it can be due to renal failure that is a classical example then 
high aldosterone conditions like primary tubular disorders like renal transplant lupus erythematosus amyloid kidney sickle cell disease obstructive uropathy uh, spironolactone amyloride all these things are drugs which can produce uh, high aldosterone hyperkalemia low aldosterone and low plasma renin hyperrenemic hypoaldosteronism prostaglandin synthetase inhibition cyclosporine that's a drug used in cancer therapy normal or high plasma renin addison species hereditary aldosterone biosynthesis defects heparin ac inhibitors but remember the most common cause for hyperkalemia in clinical practice is renal failure so the clinically important hyperkalemia always it will be renal failure so whenever a patient coming with bradycardia who is having renal failure think about hyperkalemia and spurious hyperkalemia uh, that is if the potassium is high and kidneys are normal first think about spurious hyperkalemia repeat the sample now management of hyperkalemia is very very important uh, whenever hyper you see hyperkalemia clinically significant hyperkalemia for membrane stabilization we have to always give calcium gluconate so if there is an ecg finding don't hesitate to give calcium gluconate if there is no ecg change then no need of uh, calcium gluconate you can give calcium gluconate 10% 10 ml or 10 minutes that's a dose of cal uh, calcium gluconate and the effect lasts for at least 30 to 60 minutes dose can be repeated after sometimes if there is a significant ecg change so calcium directly antagonizes the membrane actions of hyperkalemia it decreases membrane excitability and while hypocalcemia increases the cardiotoxicity and hyperkalemia so calcium gluconate, gluconate can be uh, uh, can be given in hyperkalemia so that is the first drug shifting of potassium into the cells there is a second thing so first one is membrane stabilization second thing is insulin dextrose infusion insulin dextrose infusion can shift the potassium into the cells so that is very important second line of drug in hyperkalemia is insulin dextrose infusion you can take 25 to 50% dextrose 25 or 50% dextrose under the mind with 10 units of insulin that can be given as a bolus remember if the patient is having high hyperglycemia avoid dextrose give only insulin if the patient is having hypoglycemia avoid insulin only dextrose so both are possible all three uh, management strategies are okay so you can give either dextrose with insulin only insulin or only dextrose depending on the uh, blood sugar values all will do same action that is shifting of potassium into the cells sodium bicarbonate sodium bicarbonate is used only in emergencies like if the patient is having impending cardiac arrest or already cardiac arrest and hyperkalemia is there you can give sodium sodium bicarbonate 7.5 percent 50 to 100 ml is given as a bolus slowly over 10 to 20 minutes followed by iv sodium bicarbonate as a drip so sodium bicarbonate should be used or reserved only in a patient who is having hyperkalemic cardiac arrest or impending cardiac arrest that's all salbutamol nebulization so we have to give high dose salbutamol nebulization uh, continuously so that again the shift of uh, potassium can occur now once we give emergency treatment then you can give lasix that is furosemide 80 to 100 mg iv can be given to remove the potassium through the kidneys but remember already if the patient is having renal failure lasix will not work if complete renal shutdown is there the lasix is not going to work if the if there is a good urine output then lasix may work if there is no urine output then better to take this patient for dialysis if there is no improvement after after the traditional treatment now cation exchange resins like sodium polystyrene sulfonate or sodium zirconium uh, cyclosilicate can be given to reduce the absorption of the potassium from the intestine so it can be given as oral per rectal enema or oral sachets can be 
given it binds the potassium they are called as potassium binders so they will prevent the absorption of potassium from the body so this chart may help you to uh, treat hyperkalemia but remember whatever may be given in the textbook hyperkalemia if you are seeing in your ward or emergency room always check that whether this hyperkalemia is serious or not the easiest way to diagnose that is to see the creatinine if the creatinine is normal unless until there is an endocrine cause the patient will not develop a clinically significant hyperkalemia so there may not be an urgent treatment requirement for this patient so always see the potassium then see the creatinine creatinine is normal this potassium may be spurious repeat the sample if it is again elevated look for endocrine causes drugs all these things to see whether the, there is anything which can retain the potassium in our body and sometimes shift hyperkalemia can occur due to the channel of this that also should be ruled out and renal failure is the most important cause for hyperkalemia so if the creatinine is always uh, already elevated then it is a reason for hyperkalemia is renal failure and acute renal failure patients have more significant symptoms due to hyperkalemia than chronic renal failure so hyperkalemia you can give acute calcium gluconate insulin dextrose infusion salbutamol sodium bicarbonate should be given in an impending arrest or arrest diuretics can be given lasix should be given to remove the potassium through the uh, urine hemodialysis should be done if the patient does not improve with the traditional treatment then potassium binders can be given to prevent the absorption of potassium chronic again dietary dietary advice is most important in this type of patients because uh, uh, patient who is having renal failure if they try if they uh, avoid food items which contains high potassium can itself reduce the serum potassium level so they have to be very careful avoid fresh fruits fruit juices like substances which contain high potassium should be avoided so diet counseling is very very important so we have discussed about hyperkalemia one of the most common clinical scenario in emergency room especially in patients who is having renal failure so potassium can produce dangerous arrhythmias sometimes muscle weakness but the most common finding will be arrhythmias so always when the, whenever there is a significant hyperkalemia always try to Uh, uh, give calcium gluconate and prevent the arrhythmias first.